So as you heard, I've recently been appointed as CEO of Biocurate and thinking about the biggest challenge that faces Biocurate, I thought I would prepare this talk. Basically, 10% of the time it works every time. So that title comes from the film Anchorman. My son, who's a graduate and MD from the Mayo Clinic, is also a comedian. And in the film Anchorman, there's a scene where the main character tries this aftershave and uh, it attracts women. And he says, 60% of the time, it works every time. So my son said, well, hang on, isn't that what you're talking about? I said, I wish. 10% of the time is closer to the truth. So first, my disclosure information. You heard that I'm CEO of uh, Biocurate. Before that, uh, I continue to work and consult for a number of biotech companies. I worked for two startup companies, Acrivia and Tetralogic. Actually, I still own stock in Tetralogic. It's worth absolutely nothing. The company crashed, but that's one of the startup joys that one has. Uh, for 10 years, I was the head of hematology oncology research at Amgen. And before that, I was a physician and a research scientist here in Melbourne. And already, I know what you're all thinking. He looks so much younger than David Curtis. How could that be true? <laughs> I'll reward you later, David, I promise. So this is the advertising slide. Uh, Biocurate is a new initiative between Melbourne and Monash University. It takes advantage of the outstanding research scientists, science at Melbourne and University, and we're tasked with turning that into something that's clinically or commercially valuable. So that's the job. Uh, each university has contributed $25 million, the state government $10 million, so we've got $60 million. At the moment, we're reviewing about 35 projects from the two universities. That's underway. Clearly, with $60 million, we won't be able to fund all of them, but we will try and find additional funds to develop those projects in ways that we might be able to bring them to clinical or commercial success you understand why Melbourne's such a great place to live. From the international perspective, the two universities together rank in the top 10 in half a dozen different areas. So it's a great scientific environment in which to be working. So what is the single biggest challenge that faces biotechs today? The fundamental problem is the irreproducibility of science. So when we first published this in 2012, we received hate mail, we received threats, we were told we were stupid and incompetent. In fact, Weinberg most recently in the book said something along the lines, he regards our work as a testament to the stupidity and incompetence of the pharma industry, from no less than Robert Weinberg. I was amazed that he put that in print, but he did. So what I'm not talking about is a fraud. I won't use that word again. These results do not challenge, to my mind, the validity or the legitimacy of the scientific method. The subject I am talking about is laziness, sloppiness, ignorance, exaggeration, and perhaps most, desperation. I believe that the vast majority of investigators want to do the right thing, and the fact that this is occurring in public, to me, speaks to the strength of our scientific system. So this is the main message. Almost everything you read in the literature is wrong. <laughs> Be sceptical. So Kathy was just talking about big data. I'm talking about little data, too little data. Whatever you read is almost certainly wrong. This is the key message, and now you can leave. <laughs> so my area is cancer, and cancer is evolution. And I don't know if anyone in the room is focused on cardiology. I like enjoying teasing the cardiologists. Cardiology is just plumbing. <laughs> the big advantage, of course, is that most Australians at least believe in plumbing. The problem we have is that biology sets the bar. Biology is really tough, frankly, even cardiology, is really tough. Our models are lousy, our cell lines are lousy. We really construct models that bear little relationship to the truth. We draw linear diagrams because we like them. And perhaps most importantly, we fail to give up when our favorite hypothesis is destroyed. Biology here sets the bar. But we do have an opportunity. The opportunity is inherent to our system. Our system is set up to reward perverse incentives. It's set up to reward publications in the top tier journals. That's how we get our next grant. That's how we get our fellowship. They're the perverse incentives that are much easier to address than the fundamental biology that we want to address 
in our diseases. Here, we set the bar. The poor experimental design, lack of binding, blinding, poor quality reagents, poor analysis and so on contributes to this fact that most of the data that we read is not able to be reproduced. When I first joined Amgen, I set out to understand why we terminated projects, figuring that my successor would need to understand why we'd stopped particular projects. And if, for example, it was simply because we didn't have a tool, but that the target was still legitimate, and a new tool arose, that might be a project that they wanted to undertake. So I kept a record of why we started and terminated projects. And for 10 years, uh, at the, when I was leaving, reviewed that and found that 90% of the time, we were unable to reproduce the findings published in Nature, Science and Cell. It was actually worse than that because when we couldn't reproduce the work, we went to the investigator's lab that had published that work in Nature, Science and Cell, asked them to reproduce the work, and they could not. <laughs> to have an investigator go into their lab required a confidentiality agreement, and so I can't disclose to you the labs that we went to. Sadly, Amgen's experience is not unique. Bayer Health have said the same thing, and since then, uh, Novartis, Merck, AZ have all come out saying that this is ex their experience and they've been surveys published from Nature and so on indicating that this is correct. So when we published our paper, I got a, an email from a postdoc, maybe one of you, saying, you must tell me the papers that you couldn't, couldn't reproduce because I might be working on that project. And that's absolutely true, but I can't. What I did do was sat down and looked at the papers that we could reproduce versus the ones where we could not. And these were the things that were in common. And I urge you to remember this because there will be some tangible rewards in a few minutes' time. First, were studies blinded? They're almost never blinded. And when I'm reading a paper now, the first thing that I do is search for the word blind or blinding in a paper. And if it's not there, the paper is already devalued. Were all the results shown? Typically not. You know what it's like when you get a Western blot. Typically, people cut out a sliver, give us a window of a gel. They don't show us size standards. We don't see the rest of the gel. Were the experiments repeated? Sadly, typically not. Most <coughs> studies in nature, science and cell are only performed once. Were positive and negative controls shown? Typically, that's not the case. Were the reagents validated? Almost never. Monoclonal antibodies used in these studies are almost never validated. And was the analysis appropriate? Seldom are they an appropriate analysis. So to get you ready for this, here are some examples of some Western blots that we performed at Amgen and that we published in the, on the left here. And these were supposed to be detecting the erythropoietin receptor. What people published is actually the gel on the right, where they'd excluded all of the other bands and they said, now we're detecting the erythropoietin receptor. The band they were looking at was not the erythropoietin receptor, it was actually a heat shock protein. We told Upstate that this was what their antibody did. They took it off, them, off the market. Santa Cruz continues to sell that antibody. That <laughs> antibody is so good that it can even detect the erythropoietin receptor in mice that don't have the gene for the erythropoietin receptor. <laughs> That's how good it is. And that's shown in the panel on the left. You can see an immunohistochemistry analysis of an EPO receptor knockout mouse showing EPO receptor. And then they've used an illegitimate control. So they've used a peptide that was used to generate that antibody. And any protein that contains that peptide will be competed out. So they've competed out heat shock protein 90, as it happens, with that peptide and concluded it's the erythropoietin receptor. So this is an example of a control that's used. It's just an illegitimate control. That same antibody, actually a mouse antibody, was used in a paper in 2015 published in Cancer Cell. It's absolute nonsense. Doesn't matter. It's in Cancer Cell from one of the most prestigious organisations in the world and it was used to stratify women with breast cancer and uh, correlate expression of the alleged erythropoietin receptor, a mouse antibody, that doesn't even detect the receptor to outcome in those women. So the other problem that we have is that as human beings, we think in a linear fashion, whether we're building houses or making birthday cakes or tablets, we make one at a time. So we have time on the horizontal axis and the number of houses on the vertical axis. Cell growth is not linear. If it were linear, then one cell there, number three, would give rise to one cell. 
four cells would give rise to five. That would be a linear equation, but it's not. Cell growth is an exponential function. So one cell gives rise to two, gives rise to four, and so on. And you'll have to forgive me for going over this, but as you'll see, the leaders in the scientific community don't understand this. So if cell proliferation is an exponential function, we should have a log scale on the left, on the right, not a linear scale. What that means is that eight cells is no different to nine cells, 8,000 cells is no different to 9,000 cells, 80,000 cells is no different to 90,000 cells. It's not a linear function. In fact, 512 cells is no different to 1,024 cells. That's one cell division. There is no difference between those numbers, even if they're statistically significantly different. My allegation is that the reviewers, editors of the top tier journals, grant review committees, promotion committees, and the scientific community repeatedly tolerate poor quality science. 